he was on the couch with his head back and I yelled two or three times and he didn't answer me and when I went in I was going to shake him to get him up and when I touched him he was cold. I don't know exactly when we decided or when we realized there was a problem. We started missing some items around the house. I had a leaf blower that disappeared. I had a lawnmower, a weed eater or something. Things like that that turned up missing that never had before. And at some point when we realized it was he was doing it, I took Alex to, I had a friend of mine who did polygraph examinations for a local police department. And I got my friend to meet with us one night and we took Alex there for polygraph examination. And when we left the place, uh, Alex got back in my car and we started to go and I said, son, we've got a problem and we're gonna have to do something about it. You're in my car now, we're either going to jail or we're going to a rehabilitation facility and get you checked in and get you some help. And he said, Granddad, I, I, I'll go to the rehab. Uh, if you'll take me home, I'll get Dad to carry me down there. I'll get Dad, Dad to carry me tomorrow. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. That's not the way it works. Uh, we go now either to jail or to the rehab facility. And he stayed there for about six months and he did really, really well. And was clean and he came back home and things went well and then again some things started turning up missing. Uh, Alex finally came to us and said that he was slip he had slipped back and he was going to do something about it and he went and checked himself in. When he finished that program he came home clean. He started to go to school at Gwinnett and his folks live up at Big Canoe in the mountains and that was too far to commute so we let him come and he was living in our basement at our house. My oldest son had the restaurant there in Roswell, the Roswell Tap, and he let him come there to work. The last night that he lived he was working there and he was in very good spirits. We went, we had dinner there that night. Sometime during the night he came in, I don't know when. We didn't hear him when he came in. I got up the next morning to go to my Saturday morning breakfast, went down there, didn't think anything about it. His car was in the driveway. When I left there, I went back to Roswell and stopped at the tap. My daughter-in-law was there. And when I went in, she said, have you, seen, uh, have you seen Alex this morning and uh, is he okay? And I said, yeah, why? She said, well, he's supposed to be here. He's supposed to open up. We open at 11.30 and he's supposed to be here to open up and he's not here and uh, George is not gonna be happy. I said, well, don't tell him. I'm gonna run to, the, I'll run to the house and see he must be sleeping in. Maybe he overslept. And I went to the house. His car was backed in the driveway, hadn't been moved. I went in and went down the stairs. I heard the television going. I yelled several times for him. He didn't answer me. I went back to the back to his bedroom and the bed had not been slept in. I came back into the room where the television was. He was on the couch with his head back and I yelled two or three times and he didn't answer me and when I went in, I was going to shake him to get him up, and when I touched him, he was cold. And that's when I realized that there was something wrong, and I started yelling at him, and, and uh, he didn't move. I uh, called 911 and told the, the, the dispatcher, talked me through giving him CPR. <coughs> I was doing that. When George, my son, came, he came in and said, Dad, it, it's too late, he's gone. And I said, no, he's not, get off of me, get away from here, he's still breathing. And uh, he went outside 
And then the next thing I knew, the, he came through the doorway with two or three people from the emergency, the first responders. And uh, they came in and, and uh, pulled me away that it was too late, that he was already deceased. Everybody looks and says, well, not in my family, or that couldn't happen to me, or they're just not really touched by it. And yet, if you really think about it, I don't know of a family anywhere that hasn't been touched by it. Either, either a family member has become addicted to opioids, or they have been victimized by somebody who had become addicted to them, who was having to steal something to support a habit. And when they put something that's even more powerful in it, and, and if you're used to taking two grams of something or one gram of something, and they lace it with something that's two or three times as powerful, and you use that one gram again, it's gonna kill you because it's so much more powerful. Then a day that goes by that we don't think about him and he's not on our mind. You never get over something like that. You learn to live with it because you don't have a choice. You learn to live with it.